So the speaker is Dr. William Davis. He is a consultant psychologist and head of applied clinical psychology at the Association for Psychological Therapies, APT. Post-qualification courses written by him have been studied by over 125,000 mental health professionals, meaning that his input has influenced interventions with literally millions of people. So I am going to be quiet and leave you with Dr. Davis. All yours, Will. Lovely. Thanks, Ames, very much. So um, higher order therapy looks at the higher order factors that occur across therapies. And that's what we're doing week after week at the moment, uh, looking at higher order therapy. So the ones that uh, occur across therapies are things like assessment, case formulation, practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice, and so on and so on. But it also looks at the most effective elements that are in specific approaches, such as CBT and DBT and ACT and solution-focused therapy, and so on. All the most, all, all the main therapies, in fact. So some things are specific to particular therapies. Some things are across therapies, like mindfulness appears in lots of therapies and so on. We try and cover all the main things that, that occur in anything. So the aim is to master all the main effective measures of psychological therapy and build them into an integrated approach called higher order therapy. The idea is not to have allegiance, ballot, <laughs> allegiance uh, bias, where one, you know, where one person says one therapy is best, another person says another therapy is best. Why can't we have the best bits of everything? So today's topic is consultation meetings, and it is one of the pillars of quality control and uh, support for therapists. It is one of the main things. So it's great to see, I can't remember how many, we had about 400 registrations, something like that. So it's wonderful at half term and everything that we've got so many, so many registrations. It is very, very important, uh, very important topic. Um, it's a short one though. So there's plenty of space for uh, contributions and questions. And I think uh, you know, one or two people have said that you know, part of the appeal of these Wednesday afternoons is the actual topic and the lecture and so on, which is nice. But the other appeal of it is this sort of forum where people can get together and have a sort of chat, as, as it's called in Zoom, literally a bit of a, a communication with each other, which isn't so easy all the while if you're working from home or whatever it is. So there we are. That's, uh, that's my... Oh, the only last thing I think is... Once Amy switches on, it's a recording. It's still me, it's all right. It's a recording. And once Amy switches it on, it turns all sort of, um, you know, studio quality, which is a bit daunting when you're used to a nice Zoom, which is kind of tinny and whatnot. Uh, so it turns all studio quality, but don't let that, uh, don't let that deter you. Welcome to the APT's module on consultation meetings and how to set them up reliably and well. Often enough, I like to start these talks with a metaphor, but this time there's absolutely no need. So let's just look at what consultation meetings are all about. It is simple enough. They are meetings of professionals involved in the same or similar enterprise. So it might be a meeting of DBT practitioners or CBT practitioners, or IPT practitioners, or people who are seeing depressed patients, or anxious patients, or patients experiencing psychosis or substance misuse, and so on. It can be anything, but the best such meetings are quite closely focused. So everybody has a good idea of what everybody else is experiencing and talking about. And why might we want such a meeting? Two reasons, quality control and to support each other. Therapists who see patients one-to-one -one are at risk of drifting from best practice unless they meet up with their peers and colleagues and discuss in some detail what it is they do. And in terms of support, the idea is that you both receive and give support. So while some of us might say we don't need support, we ought not really to be saying that we shouldn't support others. And really, we all need support. There is a tendency sometimes to see therapists as rather like the sun, the original source of energy and goodness, which needs no replenishment. It is just there every day for us all to take from it as much as we want. 
And unfortunately, therapists are not actually like the sun. They are more like real human beings who do need nourishment, support, validation, and so on. I'm afraid you can't relax because Olga's come in with a great question straight away. Is it very similar to supervision? Oh, and you just muted well. Yeah, uh, well, yes, it is, uh, except it's more like uh, peer supervision, really. It's a funny word, supervision, isn't it? Because, you know, strictly speaking, it means, you know, vision from above, supervision, vision from above. But, uh, but the consultation meetings are typically more like peer supervision, although in fairness, it's almost, almost like a multidisciplinary team. So you might have peers, you might have people above you and below you in seniority. So it's, uh, it's people doing the same task as you, yeah. Super. Good question, Olga. I thought Will was looking a bit relaxed. <laughs> so that's what they are. And when do these meetings take place? I suggest one and a half hours every week. 90 minutes every week. I don't know whether this seems like an extravagant use of time to you because most therapists have large caseloads and busy schedules. But even so, to be spending less than 4% is what it works out at. Less than 4% of our time in reflecting with others about what we are doing and supporting each other in doing it. That seems to me like quite a small amount of time. So one and a half hours per week is a good investment, I would suggest. And where do you hold these meetings? Often enough, this isn't quite such a trivial question as it seems at first sight. These consultation meetings are a grand thing to a grand purpose. So the detail of where you might hold them can seem to be just that, a detail. However, too often it is this specific detail that makes them difficult. People find difficulty getting a meeting room that is suitable at the same regular time every week. No one's office is big enough for half a dozen people to sit in properly, looking like they are real professionals undertaking a good purpose. So I suggest you promote this detail. By hook or by crook, ensure that you get a decent room to meet up in, at the same time, every week. The other detail you might like to return to is just who should attend these meetings. Our natural generous response is anybody who wants to, but I don't think that is quite good enough. The key concept is that everybody at the meeting is involved in a similar enterprise and trying to achieve it in a comparable fashion. So before you set your meeting up, you need to think carefully about this. Because once you invite people to it, it is difficult to uninvite them to later meetings. Got a good topical question from Lynn now. Have yeah. you found that they transfer well to Zoom or MS Teams? Oh, yeah, absolutely so, yes. Because, um, well, yes, I can say no more. They, um, it gets around the problem of trying to find a decent room too. No, yeah, Sue just, has just put that now we can meet remotely. The issue of rooms is less of an issue. So. Absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, super. Oh, and just while we're here, is there an ideal size for such a group? Well, yeah, I think there is actually. And the rule of thumb is five to eight. Uh, not more than uh, above eight, and it gets a little bit like crowd control. Uh, less than five, and you're wondering if, it's, if you've got a quorum. So five to eight is ideal. But you, you have two and three sometimes. It's as long as everyone's involved in the same enterprise. And Jana has asked, are these meetings about patients? Yes, they are about patients. Uh, and they're about all sorts of aspects of patients. The actual therapeutic approach we're adopting. Like, for example, if everyone in the meeting is doing DBT, then part of the job is to keep people up to scratch on DBT and not allow them to drift from, from DBT. Uh, same applies to CBT or solution focused therapy or whatever it would be. Um, but yes, especially about patients and about us, because it's support for us as well. Um, and sorry to be like a broken record, but if anyone wants everybody to see their um, comments, they do need to click all panellists and attendees, then the delegates can see the comments too. Okay. So you're aiming for a meeting of half a dozen or so people 
all of whom have a shared bond of practicing a particular therapy or treating a particular group of patients or something like that. So now it's time to look at just how we do this. I've put a couple of very good resources for you in your resources uh, folder. So let's look at them now. Don't worry if you're on the train or out running or whatever. I'll go through them now and you can download them when you're back at your computer. Let's have a look at the example consultation meeting agreement. The first thing to bear in mind is that this is simply an example. So you might want to uh, adopt it just as it is, but you might want to amend it. Personally, I think it is a very good example, just as it is. Number one on the list is that we set a high priority on attending and participating in the meeting. Not everybody is terrifically good at prioritizing. So if something else crops up, they may tell us exactly that. Something else has come up, I won't be able to attend the meeting. Even though whatever it is that has come up may not be nearly as important as the meeting. The trouble is that regular weekly events can automatically be seen as low priority items, which this one definitely is not. Number two, we agree to try and keep an open mind. Why? Because otherwise, we would just cycle what is already in our minds. This is a tricky one because some people are naturally open-minded and equally, some people are naturally not. So it's important to have it on our list. Otherwise, what can happen is that everybody turns up to the meeting simply to say what they think. So everybody is broadcasting and nobody is receiving. So the idea is that we do receive and we do listen to what people say. And we make a considered judgment, even if we don't agree initially, we can change our minds later on, or not, as we see right. Number three, we agree that the primary goal of this meeting is to improve our own skills as therapists. So we agree to treat other group members with respect and the belief that they are doing their best in this regard. And who knows, we may have something to learn from them. Indeed, we may have lots to learn from them. Number four, we do not have to agree with each other's positions about how to respond to a specific patient, nor do we have to tailor our behavior to be consistent with everybody else's. In other words, we are perfectly happy to tolerate differences. We are a team, teams have a diversity and they are better for that. So there's no advantage in trying to eradicate that diversity. Number five, we agree to search for empathic, non-pejorative interpretations of our patients, our own and other members' behavior. We agree to assume that we and our patients are trying our best and all of us want to improve. We agree to strive to see the world through our patients' eyes and through one another's eyes. We agree to practice a non-judgmental stance with our patients and with one another. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But on the other hand, it's easy to see the importance of it. It is sort of fundamental. Number six, we agree in advance that we are liable to make mistakes. So we won't throw up our hands in horror when either we or somebody else turns out to have made a mistake. We agree that we may have done whatever problematic things we're being accused of, or some part of it, so that we can let go of any defensive stance we might be entitled to have or feel like having to prove our virtue or competence. And because we are fallible, it's agreed that we will inevitably violate all of these agreements we've just been listing and when this is done, we rely on each other to help us get back again on track. And number seven, we know that sometimes we do outstandingly good work, which is a bit of a relief to hear, isn't it? Or at least 
work that is pleasingly competent. On these occasions, we may be willing to share it for analysis in the expectation that positive lessons might be learned from it. Okay, Benjamin's got a good tricky one for you. How can a non-pejorative, non-judgmental approach be applied to situations where acts and thoughts are illegal or societally, morally unacceptable? Whoa, yeah, that is a good one. And um, uh, just just by reassurance, I, I worked as a prison psychologist for ten years, so I'm familiar with that kind of uh, that kind of thought and behaviour. And the uh, the thing is that by and large, people don't mean to do these things. They are they are stuck with the way they are the way they are. Let me just tell a short story. It's the one that uh, sort of sticks in my mind uh, to kind of illustrate this. It was. Um, a uh, very, very serious offender who had um, <clears throat> it actually killed and sexually assaulted a, an eight-year-old boy, and he was uh, he, he was so uh, upset by that uh, afterwards. It got it got gradually worse over the years, and it culminated in that. And um, he got he was so upset by that that he knew he had to uh, kill himself. So in, this was a long time ago, and uh, he'd, he'd been in prison for decades. And uh, he put his head in a gas oven in the days when gas was toxic. And he was, uh, quote, rescued. He was unconscious at the, when they rescued him, but his aunt came around to visit. He had uh, agreed with his mother that, that he confessed to his mother, and his mother gone out to the cinema. But the aunt popped around just on the off chance, and uh, as she thought, rescued him. Uh, to a lifetime in prison, but I mean that's the that's the level of what, what people can get to. They are he, he's kind of stuck the way he was, and he knew the only way of changing was actually to take his own life to kill himself. And uh, when you when you see that kind of uh, extreme behaviour, it, it it makes you realise. My word, these you know a lot of people they just cannot help what they do. So our job is to help them do what they do. Stop doing it. Sounds good. Um, what is the difference to these of these to the consultations that a psychologist provides to staff members, for example, support workers? Well, there's a clear, the clear sort of um, um, status difference in 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 that. In what we're talking about, consultation meetings, it's people having consultation with each other. It's funny, it's a funny word, isn't it? Because consultation sounds like you talk to somebody. As it were above yourself, but uh, but no, it's a consultation of peers, peers consulting with each other. Uh, hope that helps, Vicky. And um, we're off again. <clears throat> Personally, I think this is terrifically important. I think the idea of a positive template, something that can be copied time and again and works well and has been shown to work well, I think that is a very important concept. We can see, can't we, that if we simply concentrate on eradicating mistakes, that doesn't leave us with a perfect performance. It leaves us with a vacuum. Every time that you make a mistake, that gets eradicated, and you're just concentrating on pruning, pruning, and pruning. That leaves, in the end, very little. So we do need to have a counterbalance. We need to have a positive template, something that is good, something we can copy. And finally, number eight. We know that we are all entitled to feel good about what we do. Again, it's a positive note, an important one, I think. We're all doing work that is often difficult and demanding. So we recognize that one of the entitlements of the meeting is that we will all go away feeling good about what we do. So we try to bear that in mind throughout the meeting. In other words, we try to make each other feel good in, in a proper, non-patronizing, non-condescending, sincere and genuine way. Just straightforwardly remembering that we are all entitled to feel good about doing our jobs. So there we are. That's an example of a consultation meeting agreement. And as an example, you can adopt it straight off the peg if you want to. So now let's have a look at the suggested format for a consultation meeting. 
In other words, what's going to happen in the actual meeting? Well, this is a sheet in your resources you can use as an agenda and a record keeping and a format to a degree. So on the sheet, there's a space for the date, who is chairing the meeting, who is going to be the observer to make any shrewd observations that occur to them, and a timekeeper who can tell us when our 90 minutes is up and also tell us when we spend an awful lot of time talking about one specific topic and maybe we should move on. And who is taking the minutes, which is an important job. It's a bit of an onerous job, but it's an important job because the minutes will list who is going to do what. And then we have our shared tasks for the meeting, the first of which is to review the previous minutes and to ask ourselves whether the consultation made a difference at all. Did people do what they said they were going to do? And did they refrain from doing what they said they would refrain from? For me, that single bullet is very important because people do love meetings that actually have an outcome where things are talked about and people go away and do things as a result. Equally, they hate meetings where you might regard as, uh, them as, as talking shops, where we simply talk about stuff and nothing happens. And then there's a section called prompts for identifying cases to discuss. And these are good prompts, I think. First, is there anyone who wants to stop working in this specialism? Whether the specialism is using DBT or whatever therapeutic approach we're talking about, or working with people who have substance misuse problems or depression or whatever the specialism is. So that's the first one deliberately, because as a general rule, we really don't want to lose people who are working in the same specialism as us. It's probably an important specialism, so we don't want to lose people from it. So if there's something we can do to help the person who is thinking this way, then that's probably what we want to focus on. Secondly, is there anyone with a client who currently poses a risk to themselves or to other people? The same thing. This is a very high priority. It's a very high priority item. And if this is the case, then we need to get our heads together and see what we can do to manage the risk. And then we come on to ones that are very important, but not quite so important as the first two. So number three is, is there anyone who is finding that a particular client behavior is impacting on their ability to work with that client? Mm -hmm. The next one is, is there anyone who wants to give up working with a particular client for whatever reason? The next one is, is there anyone experiencing a strong emotion about a particular client? And that strong emotion might be any emotion you choose to think of. It doesn't have to be a negative emotion. And the next one is, is there anyone experiencing a lot of judgments about a client? Okay, we have a question from Nadia. How much should these meetings be used to discuss cases, what to do, how to understand clients, versus to offer support to increase therapist wellbeing when working with difficult cases? Might members of groups not have quite different agendas? Brackets talking about themselves versus talking about clients. Oh, sorry, well, you're just on mute. <clears throat> yeah, I think absolutely they can do. It's um, uh, people arrive at the meeting with different priorities. And that's, that's really important, I think. It's uh, never the case that everyone arrives thinking exactly the same thing. They have different, uh, different views, different priorities. And it's 90 minutes, so we try and uh, we try and cope with as much as we can. So if people are stuck with a particular client, then we can uh, see if we can help unstick them. If people are you know, stuck with a particular uh, format of therapy, likewise. So there's no um, there's no constraint. It doesn't matter that we arrive with different um, uh, different priorities. And if the meeting is in between peers, who's going to decide who will take minutes, keep time, etc.? Uh, will there be someone who's taking a leading role? Yeah, no, good, uh, good question. Um, this, I, mean, the, I suppose what I've put to put here is only an example, but the example suggests that uh, you, you're kind of equal and you take it in turns. 
So the chair will be different uh, each week, the minute date will be different each week, and so on. You don't have to do it like that. It can be that there's a, a natural chair, and you might have the same chair for six months or a year or whatever, and then swap it over at that point. It, uh, it's, there's, there's no absolute rules to it, although whatever rules you want, I think it's good to uh, consolidate and agree on them so, and not, not be um, debating the rules every week. Um, and just to answer Deb's question, we won't send this out, but um, they are all available on a recording on our website, um, normally from about Friday onwards. Um, and David's um, commented that as a member of a DBT consult that uses a similar format, we meet on a weekly basis, especially when working with risky clients. Yeah, yeah. And Randa's asked, would you have an observer? Uh, yes, well, well, typically on in this format, there is a, there's a role of observer, yeah. Uh, Marshall Linehan calls it an elephant keeper, where they shout out elephant in the room, which would the kind of role that would suit you very well, Amy, I think. It's not, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, if something is not being discussed when it kind of should be, it's a kind of obvious thing, it should be discussed and everyone's skirting around it, you can shout out elephant in the room. Um, but uh, yes, but the, uh, an observer is uh, a more conventional title for such a person. That does sound like a fun role. <laughs> <laughs> Julie has asked, how do we help our clients who might be having strong feelings and very fixed beliefs about clients? How do you help them retain empathy? Well, it's, that's a good question, isn't it? And of course, uh, as ever, it varies according to who your colleague is and what the strong feeling is and, uh, and, and so on. It's a bit like, you know, it was, it was it's very like with a patient. When you see a patient, it all depends on what the problem is and what the patient's like and what would suit them and, and so on. And I think it's exactly the same with uh, with us professionals. There's, there's no no real difference between us, you know. Okay, and one last one from Sylvia. What if the client is um, a preparation for problem and twisting the reality about us as professionals? Yeah. Um, the thing to do is to share it at the meeting that is that is what you do that is the purpose of the meeting that's exactly it's exactly the kind of issue that would be spot on for bringing up at the at the meeting and uh, other people there might actually know the same patient might have had dealings with the same patient or they might know you and, and know what what you would find helpful but whatever you bring it up at the meeting and see what your colleagues have to say oh and a nice logistic one from alta is it more effective to have a consultation meeting at the start or the end of the week? Ah, good one. Uh, I, do you know, I don't know of any sort of work that's been done on that. Um, um, uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know. No. Okay, on that one, I will carry on. So those four questions are all important questions and they all give us a chance to be supportive of one another. They help us to identify and encourage people to say when things are being difficult for them and enable us to express our support and better still perhaps to give some ideas that might be helpful or some practical support that might be helpful. And then the final bullet is, I think, as important as any. It says, does anyone have an example of work that is going particularly well at the moment for us to analyze and maybe draw constructive lessons from? Now, that's important because it's philosophically crucial that we look at things that are good and they can be copied because the more things that are good and we copy, the more high quality becomes the service that we offer. If we do that, then we are constantly spreading good quality throughout the service. Practically, it's also good. Otherwise, the meetings can become very dour, looking at all the difficulties that can present themselves and the different shades of the types of difficulties that can present and being good at problem solving these things. That's all very good and very excellent practice. But it can become pretty punishing. So it's good to have something that redresses the balance to a degree. It's good and important. So, there we are. In your resources are five things. There is the transcript of this talk. 
There's the summary of the transcript. There's the suggested format for a consultation meeting, which is what we've just been talking about. There is the example consultation meeting agreement, which is what we were talking about before that. Okay, so we've got another good couple of questions. Uh, do consultation meetings count if there are only two people in attendance? Are these peer consultations usually recognised or counted by regulatory, sorry, or membership bodies? Oh, well, a uh, good question. I mean, depends what your regulatory bo uh, body is. I mean, uh, yeah, psychologists and nurses and psychiatrists all have different regulatory bo bodies, but um, I'd, I'd said I'd said it does. The the key point is to provide the uh, the kind of support we're talking about. Um, I, th I think there is a virtue in having numbers like you know, five to eight, something like that, that kind of number. It carries more weight when you see that the, you know, there's a kind of a body of your peers that thinks a particular thing. If you're just talking to one other person, then it doesn't really carry the same weight. You say, well, they think this, I think the other. Who's to say who's right? And you can't help but think like that. Pauline has commented that um, she tends to have consultation meetings at the start of the week. So the outcomes can be actioned straight away and also keeps the momentum going. That's good. Mark has said, once a person is invited to a meeting, you mentioned it is difficult to remove them, but do you have any method of removing them that preserves everyone's dignity and they don't go out to spoil the purpose of the meeting? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think the, the only way is to be really careful who you invite to begin with. Uh, it's one of those things, prevention is about a million times easier than cure. I've, I, it's an issue that's come up a number of times over the years, and I've never found anyone with a good answer to it. And Sebastian's come up with some good challenges, so I'll just take a couple. Um, how can we handle some of the challenges and perspectives in case conferences such as all evidence is equally good, buddy-buddy syndrome, roared everything gold, and they carry on. So perhaps, do you, do you want to stick with those three? <laughs> well, what was the first? But all, no, should we stick with, I, I quite like the idea of buddy-buddy syndrome. Yes. Well, I, I, I rather like the first one, which was uh, just because the first one, I suppose, all evidence is equally good. And I think this is a real issue, actually, you know, because um, the, 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 the feeling at the moment is quite rightly about evidence-based practice. But a lot of people take evidence to be you know, randomized controlled trials. And that's very good, there's nothing wrong with randomized control trials, they're excellent. But uh, that's not the limit of good evidence. The, uh, thank goodness people have introduced practice-based evidence. In other words, you evaluate your own practice, and if something works well for a particular client, then that's the end of the story. You know, you can't uh, say, oh, well, that shouldn't work well. If it works well, great. But you do have to evaluate what you do to see whether it is working well or, or not. And equally, um, people uh, deride sort of anecdotal evidence, you know, where something has actually happened. So we know that it's possible to happen. We say, oh, yeah, but that's anecdotal evidence. But if something has happened, that is absolutely true. So I think you, you know, have to be a little bit um, analytical about the evidence we look at. But ultimately, it is practice-based evidence. If it works for your client, it works. Oh, you wanted the, the buddy buddy Sorry. system. Yeah, I'm not oh, sure. the buddy buddy syndrome. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure what that is. To be honest, uh, I, I, uh, I bet I should know. I'm, I bet I uh, should know what that is. Hopefully, we'll you, people will flood in. And say, oh, for goodness' sake, the buddy buddy system is syndrome is um, whatever it is. It sounds friendly, but I have a feeling it might not be. Yeah, doesn't sound good. I don't think. <laughs> um, so that was the end of the audio, but we never made it to review who is going to be in the hot seats next time. Do you want to have a little talk about that one? Oh gosh, that's uh, that, yes. No, that's the that's what I was talking about with um, you know, who's who's going to take different roles. So who's going to be the chair next time? Who's going to um, uh, who's who's going to be taking the minutes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, who's going to be in the different roles? Because that. Oh, by the way, um, because we're talking and there's no written things. Uh, I'm I've missed out on the acknowledgement in the written sheets. There's acknowledgements, and of course, as somebody commented about DBT. The, um, the, the original one I based this on was Marsha Linehan, who is, does, does some very good, uh, very good materials there for DBT. So acknowledgement to Marsha Linehan. Um, yeah, and, and she, like, like what I've described, 
is uh, very, very equal and so on. And it's, you just decide who's going to take the roles next time. There isn't an automatic chair. Oh, and Soph has helpfully given us a suggestion about Buddy Buddy, which is it where people are too cosy and just agree with each other's decisions rather than challenging and reviewing? Yes. Yeah. So if you want to let us know about that one, that will be helpful. Yeah. That will be for next time. What do, they, what do they call it these days? The echo chamber, isn't it? Where you um, you simply get people into the meeting who you know, echo your own views. And Catherine's agreed. Sounds like agreeing with your friends for no other good reason. <laughs>